Welcome to the program. This is What's Your Story? I am Catherine Mwangi here at the Golden Tulip Hotel in Westlands. We are grateful to the management for availing this beautiful business suite to tape this show from. Now, my next guest is a gentleman from Migori. He is a soldier, <laughs> the first I'm having on the show. My crew is silent and humbled because how is it later at this point in time? I'm protected. But George reached out to me on uh, social media, Facebook to be specific, uh, with a story that he wanted to share. And it's, it's the first time I'm you know, catalyzing a story of this nature. And I thought it's really important because especially for men and men in relationships and also women too, to a large extent, you get to listen to your story and know uh, how to just get yourself out of situations that I would call perhaps now sticky situations in relationships. But let me not, you know, belabor the point. It's not my story to tell. It's George Chacha's story to tell. You're most welcome to the show. Thank you, Catherine. And uh, you left, you woke up at what time today? <laughs> I woke up at 4.30 in the morning. Yeah. And uh, by 5, I left the house. Yeah. And um, at uh, 5.30, uh, around 5.15, I was already at the, uh, the bus office. Yes. And I left at 5.30. Wow. I mean, you traveled all the way. Um, and and mm -hmm. we will get to the, your reasons for wanting to share this story. For me, it was a bit obvious, but I also hope that for my audience it will be. Uh, but tell me about, first of all, your life uh, in the Air Force. I enlisted into the Kenya Air Force in 1990, the month of May, mm -hmm. 4th of May, actually, 1990. Um, I underwent the rigorous military training in uh, Moy Barracks. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's a uh, recruit training school in Eldoret. And then after a grueling seven months training, I graduated, uh, whereby I was uh, posted to Moy Air Base. Then later on, I was to join Kenya Armed Forces Technical College, mm -hmm. where I underwent a six-year training on aeronautical engineering. Uh, I graduated, uh, having su very, very successfully completed my training. Mm -hmm. I worked on the Buffalo aircraft since my graduation up to the time of retirement. The Buffalo aircraft is the, at that time, it was the biggest transport aircraft in the Air Force mm -hmm. that had different roles. It could provide VIP flight for the president. It could provide cargo transport. It could provide um, ordinary passenger transport. Yeah. Uh, it could provide casualty evacuation because you only need to change the roles of the seats. Mm -hmm. until uh, 2007 when I uh, retired after oh, you're so 18 young. years. What do you mean you retired? Mm, I retired. I'm actually a pensionable <laughs> officer. <laughs> um, I felt that the 18 years was enough. Okay. I really aspired into politics. Oh. I must be honest. I okay. felt like I wanted to join politics. Mm -hmm. But then when I went... When I reached the ground, I realized that things are not like I thought when I was in Nairobi. Then my entire life, I spent it, I'd spent it in Nairobi. Mm. And now I had relocated back to the village. Mm -hmm. uh, then I changed all together. And um, I have been doing issues to do with peace building and conflict resolution, civic education on, yeah. issue, on leadership and governance. Yeah. Um, something that saw me go for further studies in Thailand in Bangkok, where I had to go and study professional development certificate in peace building and conflict resolution. So, tell me about your sons. I see you're a father to sons only. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, my firstborn son came about in 1994, and it was the most joyful moment in my life. As I held him on my hands, and I lifted him up like the roots, Kinta Kunte, the way Kinta Kunte lifted his, um, his son, and uh, I said, behold, the only thing greater than thyself. That was the most joyful moment in my life, mm. holding my son. Then um, uh, two years later, a second born came. And two years later, a third born came. Mm. And then uh, a fourth born came so many years later. Yes. Unfortunately, my second born died. Actually, oh. this month on 31st, I will be comm commemorating his second anniversary since his death. And again, that marks the most, uh, the, the saddest moment in my life. Mm. When I walked out of my house at 10.30 p.m., as I looked for my son, because I was wondering where he is, and there on the tree my son hung, who had just graduated 
from Moi University with a degree in strategic management. My son died and I had to fish him or get him out from the tree. It wasn't an easy task. It was not until midnight. So every time I remember this, it makes me sad, but it gives me strength to live, that I have to conquer. His death has given me strength like I have never had. Mm. Mm. So he hung himself on a tree? He hanged himself, yeah. Did you ever get to know why? <clears throat> uh, he had mental health, and now trying to reflect or maybe take back things, I realize he had it from as far as grade three, grade four. Now, when I look at the incidents that were happening, I realize that it dates back yeah. to the time when he was a boy, yeah. maybe in class three, class four, class five. Mm. Mm. Wow. Yeah. I'm sorry to learn about that. Mm. I, I read a lot that it's very hard for a parent to lose a child. And uh, I'm sorry that you went through that. You said mm -hmm. that it has given you strength. It gives me strength because yeah. every time I think about him, I want to live forever. Every time I think about him, it's like I have a battle that I must win. And the only way of winning it is by telling his story, sharing his experience, um, it's just being good to my remaining sons, being good to their mother, mm. that gives me strength. Mm. It colors my life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about uh, their mom. And um, so you, you got married when? We got married, um, we got married the last week of December 1993, but we started living together on the 1st of January 1994. Why were you apart for a week? Um, we were still trying to know each other more. Okay. okay. I mean, we, I'd taken her from the village and uh, brought her to Nairobi. Mm -hmm. At that time, I was a student at uh, Kenya Armed Forces Technical College. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a house, so I was housed by a friend. Okay. Ah. Yeah, it was that kind of, I mean, we were, early, we were young, we were green, we were naive. <laughs> and I um, got into a marriage even before I was really prepared. Yes. But uh, I really loved her, and um, I wanted to make my life better than my many people that I had seen. Yeah. Um, I didn't really, I think my dad had challenges, uh -huh. so I wanted to make my marriage a great success. Mm. How old were you? Um, I was 1994. I was 25 years old. Okay. Mm -hmm. mm. I was 25 years old. Okay. So a week mm. later, then you had your place, so she could come. And you start your marriage. No, life. actually, we stayed. Uh, we, we, we both stayed. I had a very good friend known as Senior Sergeant Matinde, who actually gave me a whole bedroom and told me, Brother, stay here until whatever you want. Oh, wow. For three months, I put up with him. Yes. Uh, that's in Embakasi Garrison. Uh -huh. And uh, after three months, I told him, Now I have to go out because then I'll never learn to prosper. I'll never learn to grow. I have to go out and learn life. Mm. And uh, that's how we started. Mm -hmm. We moved to the slums of Soweto. Oh. We lived in Soweto slums for about two months. Mm -hmm. Then there was a lot of theft. You hang your clothes and they're gone. Uh, power goes off and the moment you come into your house, your thing is stolen. So I graduated to Kayole Estate now. Okay? So I stayed in Kayole for the rest of the time until I moved to Moya. Uh, my wife gave birth the same year, 1994, in, the month, uh, in October. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, she had some complications. Mm -hmm. For four months... I virtually was like her nurse uh, because uh, she couldn't bend, she couldn't uh, wash clothes. Therefore, I was a student. I would, do, I would um, leave. I mean, I would come home and wash the napkins. I don't know whether the pampas were there during that time mm. or they came much Maybe later. It was very expensive <laughs> and, you know, yeah. <laughs> But I know that I had about three or four dozens of the napkins. napkins. So when I would come in the evening, the bucket is full of the napkins. And I would wash them, wash them, I'd wash the dishes and do the necessary. For four months, I nursed my wife. Um, we lived in fourth floor. And during that time, there was a lot of water rationing. Hardly, there was hardly any water. Water doesn't go to fourth floor, only up to ground floor. And it doesn't come in the evening or during the day. It comes from one in the morning. So you have to wake okay. up. So I have to wake up. I have 
I have to somba maji from the ground floor up to the what fourth is floor. And uh, my wife couldn't help me because of her condition. What is somba? Uh, I mean, ferry water, ferrying water from the ground floor in jerry cans. So I would carry two jerry cans. Ground floor to fourth floor? To fourth floor, yes. Wow. Uh, until I would feel so many containers in the room. And um, then at four or five thereabout, I should be up because I'm supposed to be within the base. Since during that time as a student, it was not allowed for students to spend out. So it was really, I had to balance between being caught that I'm not spending in the barracks yeah. and attending to my wife. So I would have to be there very early in the morning yeah. before the instructor detects that I didn't spend out. And you'd sneak in, you sneak out and you sneak in. Would always have bed check during that time. Mm. So Chacha, what was your fascination with the military? Why did you want to be a soldier? Um, I would say that really, what I really want to become was to become a priest. Mm -hmm. Becoming a soldier was an, an afterthought, okay? Because um, while in class seven, I came across a cartoon magazine, mm -hmm. the life history of one Bishop Daniel Comboni. Okay. Daniel Comboni was an Italian priest who founded the Verona Fathers, or the Comboni missionaries. Mm -hmm. So I really got so hooked up to his life history, his simplicity, his um, sacrifice, his love for mankind, and I felt this is what I want to do. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so when I did my class seven at that time, and uh, I joined the seminary. Oh, you did? Yes, I joined the seminary. I never went through a secular secondary school. Okay. I never went through a secondary school. Uh -huh. uh, from primary school, I straight went to, to seminary, mm -hmm. but I joined a junior seminary. That was oh. a junior seminary. Then from a junior seminary, we graduated to senior seminary. So form one to form six, I was in a seminary. And um, when I finished form six, the vocation director, um, Father An Anthony Sineida, an mm -hmm. Italian priest mm -hmm. at that time, had to travel with me all the way up to Korea. Korea is along the Kenya-Tanzania border. Okay. Uh, where your phone would receive both signal from <laughs> Kenya and Tanzania, okay? And um, uh, they had to get permission from my father and mom because they, I need some, I, you have to be supported by your family. So... In order to be a priest? Yes. You, you, in other words, they have to agree that uh, we have given him out to the church. Uh. And um, mm. I went with the two priests, uh, one Italian priest and another a German priest. I remember we had a very simple home house. They slept on the floor, actually. They, they, it's like they knew they carried camping beds. <laughs> so they slept on the, uh, just on camping mm. bed along the sitting room there. And uh, then in the morning, my parents came mm -hmm. and they were asked whether they, ascend, they accept me to proceed with the priesthood. They said, no, we don't want, this is our second born son. We is our second son, so we can't allow him to go. Yeah. Then uh, the vocation director told me, now, George, we are sorry. Because of that, we cannot proceed with your request to become a priest. Convince your parents. We are leaving you with them for one year. Convince them. If they will agree at the end of the next year, we'll come back and they'll sign the forms, the consent forms. Well, you were under 18 at that time? No, no, no. It doesn't was, matter how old you it are. It doesn't matter how, you, how old you are, yes. Oh, mm -hmm. so being a priest... Because I already had an idea at that time, because uh, I was 19. So you wanting to be a priest, um, was it uh, heavily influenced by you going to a high school seminary? No, no, no. No, it was a uh, deep it, desire. Just, it was a deep desire yeah. because I read the life history, of the life Comboni. story of Comboni. Ah. To date, I still treasure that man. Yeah? Mm-hmm. So, okay, at least I've had clarity on that. Um, coming to your marriage, uh, which, which is where I want this story to go, uh, but I'm told you have to take a very short commercial break. Uh, please don't go too far. We have established his passion for priesthood. Uh, then he ended up becoming a soldier, and uh, he's a father to boys. He lost one, and that uh, young man gives him the cause and the will to leave. And his story has more layers to unravel where his marriage is concerned. Because how does a man leave everything he has worked so hard for because he wants to start a new? So we will be finding out more on that right after this commercial break. 
uh, one day she just told me, George, I think I would rather leave as a widow than live with you. And uh, things were really getting bad. And um, <clears throat> she demanded that I have to leave or otherwise something um, nasty might happen. Mm -hmm. And I didn't take that lightly. Uh, lightly. Welcome back from the break. This is What's Your Story. Today we have George Chacha, who's come all the way from Migori County, and he's sharing his family story, his career story as a military man. And we have established before the break, just in case you're joining us now, that, you know, he's a father to sons. He lost one son. Um, this will be the second year they're commemorating his memory. And now we want to delve into your marriage. Um, so you had a great marriage to start with. You met this girl, loved her. Uh, you know, she was patient enough to wait for you to move out of your friend's house. And now you started to build a life together. What, what were those days like? Um, I really, like I said earlier, I really loved a successful marriage. Mm -hmm. Even before I got married, I envisioned myself being the perfect marriage that I see on soap operas on TVs, mm. okay? Uh, the likes of the no one but you. Mm. Um, Alejandro, uh, uh -huh. those ones. Yes. Oh, we watch the same <laughs> soaps, eh? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Then, um, however, I think also the biggest problem here is that um, you get married and maybe you have extremely different personalities. Mm. And... Um, Right from the word go, really, I reckon that there were quite a lot of uh, um, conflicting uh, traits, maybe um, personalities. Mm -hmm. But then divorce for me was never an option. Mm -mm. No. I really wanted to hold on to my marriage. It had to work. By all means, it had to work. It didn't matter what was going on. It didn't matter. And I had to raise. Uh, so I know there are moments in my marriage when... Uh, we could have conflict, maybe some disagreement. For one week, we don't talk. It went on sometimes for two weeks, sometimes for three weeks. I decided, let me see if it will mm -hmm. And it lasted even one month, and you are not talking. But basics, you know, the food is here and all that. What kind of arguments were these that you go for a whole? Really petty. Yeah, you know, yeah. Some are petty. Yeah. And, um, really extremely petty. It could be an issue like, uh, why is this person calling you at seven, at eight? Mm. And sometimes it's actually very necessary. That mm. phone call is necessary. And um, How long had you courted for? We hadn't courted really. Okay. Uh, we had uh, courted maybe for about a month or so. Uh, you met her, you liked her, you struck. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Okay. So we really hadn't caught it. Okay. And, um, uh, she looked good. Of course. And I could, I mean, character. Really, I like her because one, I married a time when I had no money. Mm. She persevered. Mm. I know that I subjected her to one of the most difficult lives. Mm. Mm. I mean, I remember there's a time we would eat Nduma and strong tea for dinner. Mm. And maybe the baby, our firstborn, would have maybe, a, there, there used to be a small packet of milk at that yes, time. Yes. And uh, maybe that and something. So she never complained. She was extremely, she accommodated me in that difficulty uh, when I felt, oh my goodness, why did I marry so early? I was not prepared. Mm. Yet she said, George, we'll make it. It's okay. Never once she did she make very big expectation out of me. No. She knew my strength. By the way, before I married her, I showed her my pay slip. I'm probably the only husband who shows. <laughs> and there on my pay slip was only yeah. 2,900 shillings at that time. And I thought, please, don't have big expectation. This is what I have. This is what we live on. And from the 2,900 shillings, I was paying rent of 700 shillings. Okay? Later on, they hiked to 1,100 shillings, mm -hmm. probably the same amount of money. And uh, never so basically, she supported me. She helped me save 
despite the fact that there was hardly anything to say, mm. but still I could save. Yeah. And then, um, but mm. then it's the, basically the, we, we started differing um, that aspect of wanting not to forgive, you know, want, when she has conflicted with someone, maybe it's even from my family, she deletes that person from the heart. So finally, she ended up deleting almost everybody in my family. Mm. She ended up deleting people that they're not deletable. Mm. Yeah? Mm. And mm. it's like uh, she expected me also to delete them. And mm. It was not possible. Yeah. So uh, when we migrated to the rural, to the village now in 2010, mm. um, we were together most of the time and... Um, it wasn't easy. Yeah. From 2012, she had some problem, back problem. Then um, I assumed all the roles. She, does, she never knew where the river is. I would go to fetch water from the river with the wheelbarrow. Because our boys were big now, they were schooling in the city. And then I own one in, um, actually, outside mm. in Korea. I'm the one who would go to the river. I would go, the one who would go to the market to buy food. I would cook ugali. She couldn't cook ugali because she's talking of the back pain and all that. It's only later on, a few months ago, that people started describing, eh, do you know what people call you? Wanajua mzungu, ule mzungu mu Africa. Why do they say that? They say that you guys, we knew you people live like Westerners. Where would you find a Korean man cook? Where would you find a Korean man go to, the one who is, the one who is always buying food from the market? That's exactly what I was doing. You'd find me with a bucket of Nikona Ma India. I'm going to uh, to the posho mill, yes. Mm. I go and uh, grind the maize, come with it home. Because I really tried to lessen as much work from her as possible. Mm. I'd wake up in the morning, 5.30. I've already started washing clothes, clothing the bed sheets and all that. And then I would walk maybe to whatever I was doing. Yeah. I've been doing a, a little, con I've been doing some consultancy yeah. on human rights. I've been doing consultancy on a peace building and conflict resolution, yeah. uh, general civic education on women leadership and uh, women in politics. So basically those are the things that I would do, go out to the community to do. Mm. Okay. And um, so where did it turn? Where did this supportive uh, ever present lady in your life Mm -hmm. What what changed? What changed that uh, uh, I once asked actually once asked her that question. Okay, my love, we need to sit and talk. Where did the rain start beating us? Mm. But she does not like the truth. In my entire life of living with her, she never apologized to me. There's no one time she said, "Oh, George, I'm sorry." Yet for me, I said sorry so many times. And um, on this particular day we had ended up such that each, each of us was sleeping in different rooms, okay? I was in a different room and she was in a different room. And um, I felt that it was going away. I mean, we were drifting. Every other moment we were drifting further and further apart. Yeah. Until one day I asked her and I told her, can we sit down? I really have a lot of complaints against mm. you. Maybe mm. you also have complaints against me. And so I gave her a piece of paper and I took a piece of paper and a pen. Please write anything that you have against me. I'll do the same. Then let's exchange. Let's do our own some kind of uh, self-assessment or yeah. even therapy. Yeah. She refused. And uh, when she refused, I told, please, it's very important. She said, no, don't we, I'm, wasting, I'm, not, I'm not wasting my time. And um, Was she, Did she have friends that you could ask to talk to her? She doesn't want anybody. She says that nobody can help us in our relationship. If we can't solve our problem, no, somebody from outside can't do that. And you never got to know what the problem was. She, there's never a day she said, I don't like the way you do this. I don't like the way you say this. I don't like the way you talk to me. Never. Unfortunately, we piled. Uh, there are mistakes I would see on her. I would keep it them to myself. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, it's like that saying whereby a husband and wife are sitting by the fireplace. Then the baby falls into the fire. When I take my hands, you withdraw yours. When we withdraw, you know, that aspect until the child burns. I think what we needed to do, the two of us, was to put our hands into the fire and get a baby, namely the marriage. Unfortunately, we didn't. We were not talking about issues. We had problems, we knew them, but we would sulk. We were not talking about them. Mm. And until when she moved out. Now, 
for one year really i couldn't take it any longer i mean it was taking a toll on me mm. i mean the biological processes were overwhelming me and mm -hmm. uh, i felt like uh, now what do i do and since um, i didn't have anywhere to turn to yeah. and that's the reason why i told her that i cannot take it any longer mm -hmm. mm? you we have to talk about this mm -hmm. but from the moment she refused then i had a reason to go out mm -hmm. mm? and out there and uh, establish a relationship and then later on there was an eruption in the house there was an eruption in the family how did she know i had to tell her you told her yes how did you do that um <laughs> you see finally one way or the other i didn't want her to learn from someone else mm -hmm. i think if i told it myself mm -hmm. then she would hear it from you from me and far from the is it from the first hand information mm -hmm. other than distorted information yeah unfortunately she didn't take it kindly and uh, then things went from bad to us so you went and told her you have another family i told her that um, you remember the day i told you that we'd sit and talk and you refused mm -hmm. no mm -hmm. i went out and i realized that um, um what um, is um, currently the situation the mm -hmm. way it is and it we need to sit and talk about this and it's like no way and no 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 so basically let me say that the relationship became extremely bad and um how did you break the news to your sons um the same way i had to tell them they said well it's okay for you if you feel you are okay if you feel you are happy if it gives you solace and comfort that we are okay uh but now for her she was wild uh one day i came from work the gate was locked uh the, the, and with a different padlock from the one that we normally use and it was already 10:30 at night the driver was with me as, as i i had been blocked i tried to call i can't go through so i had to throw stones onto the roof until my niece had to come and open for me it was quite embarrassing for almost 30 minutes waiting to be opened at your gate mm. um it was, was quite violent uh, no i just entered and um, it was cold i mean cold issue and then things were really getting from bad to us i wish to talk i would request to sit and talk there's nothing you're talking there so until some point i told her, i just had to even use the universally accepted ways of resolving conflict but it still didn't work then um uh, one day she just told me george i think i'd rather leave as a widow than live with you and uh things were really getting bad and um <clears throat> she demanded that i have to leave or other something um nasty might happen mm -hmm. and i didn't take that lightly, uh, lightly especially after what i have seen this somebody you know that's all i remember mm -hmm. uh, so finally i just decided to leave and i left with my clothes my laptop and uh, just like that and they went and took a small house of about eight by eight i have a big house a big compound actually the two houses but i had to let all those go because basically again i remember this woman she was my strength she was my wisdom when i was boy she is actually the one who even molded me advised me and told me george let's buy land and build she was there to walk with me every single mile forever i will always be indebted to her and that's the reason why when she said that we must divide this we must go to court at first she wanted to go to court and i told her no my love i cannot go to court against you what is it that you want that's okay i'm leaving everything and i left all i have a big piece of land not inherited from my father but the one that i bought uh, while in the forces um so i basically felt that it maybe it will calm her down mm -hmm. and i left uh I can show you it wasn't easy you can imagine living a three bedroomed house with another house that has two bedrooms somewhere besides it a compound that is beautifully enclosed and i had to go and take an 8 by 8 small room 
Why couldn't you go to your other family? Um, it's much later now that uh, finally resolved that maybe I should move on with my life. Okay. Oh, so even when you moved out, you were still hoping for a reconciliation? I was hoping that there would be reconciliation. But then when I saw that there is no hope, chances of reconciliation, mm -hmm. because I, I mean, I can't even access the homestead. Actually, it's almost two years since, it's two, three years since I have stepped into my house. Mm -hmm. Then uh, it uh, became uh, like that. And so what, what happened is that um, I had to gather a lot of courage now and start because I was going to break. Definitely maybe I would be dead right now. I would say that even this other family has given me strength mm. that I should be, I mean, I don't cook, but now at least we, I have somewhere to eat. I have somebody to cheer me up when I'm down, mm. somebody to encourage me. Mm. But uh, still, uh, I wish it wasn't the way it is. What uh, did you tell your sons when you decided to move on? Um, Actually, it's them who told me. It's not what I told them. It's oh, them who told me. What did me. they tell you? Well, Dad, we are happy for you. All we want is for you to be happy. Mm. Mm. And if it's going to work for you that way, mm. so be it. We have no objection. And how did you come together when you lost your, your, your boy uh, two years ago? How did you and mom, his mom come together during that season? By the way, the death of that boy, mm. is the, it's after the death of this boy that we completely parted. Actually, four months after that is when she said, demanded, I must leave. So you're, you're now with your family and, you know, for somebody, I heard you when you said uh, earlier on in the show and you said all you ever wanted was to have a successful marriage. Uh, yes. I actually know somebody like that. So... So I know exactly what you're talking about, where at a very young age, you know that for me, even as I'm going up the ladder, whichever vocation you choose, but a strong marriage is like your backbone, your lifeline. Mm -hmm. And then uh, coming to, how, how long was it? How many years? 23 years. 23, 23, 23 years. 24 years. Yes, mm -hmm. so 24 years. And, and you have tried all you can to salvage uh, the love that you had and it has been rendered impossible, and you have to leave. What did that do to you? Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's true. It's it's quite painful. And um, I remember her as somebody who walked with me at the darkest moment in my life. As much as I not want to antagonize her, um, it beats me. To it beats. I fail to understand how a man has gone to the extent of killing a woman, the mother of his children, a woman who has lived with him under the same roof for so many years. Catherine, this is too difficult for me. And in all these 24 years that we were together, I never beat her. Um, however, the biggest challenge was lack of compromise. I think in life people have to compromise. There will be moments when you just have to, when it's not what I really wanted, but then let me just uh, compromise on this for the sake of the children maybe, for the sake of tomorrow. Or even if, if people are to part really, I would favor a peaceful parting. And, and your, your new, let me say new family now, mm -hmm. um, how are you able to be fully present as a husband and a father while you still have this other part of you that is broken. Actually I have had to I had to live with them permanently now and settle down um, and uh, say that it has given me quite a lot of solace, a lot of uh, comfort and uh, it's only that once in a while sometimes I try to think what could my boys because it is not what they tell me, but it's, it's what they don't tell me that worries me. Mm. Mm? I know that sometimes all could not be, may not be well. Yeah. Uh, I wish they could really speak to me and open up their minds. Mm. Um, and I wish their mother could know what her beloved sons are going through, mm. then she would really call a meeting. Um, 
last year they celebrated the first anniversary of the death of our son. Mm. I was not called and I was not there. That would have been a golden opportunity for us to talk, maybe even to help each other. Like I said, the death of this boy has given me strength. It makes me love them more, you know, every time I think of my son. Mm. It makes me love my ex-wife mm. more. It makes me love my sons even more. Mm. And um, so I know healing is a process. I know at some point I will overcome. Uh, just the other day I was trying to consider now. These are grown men. Why do I have to keep on worrying about them so much? Maybe I should let them go. I should let them be. Hmm? Whoever wants to, whoever will be looking for a uh, shoulder to lean on, my shoulder will be there. But I cannot try, I don't want to kind of want to contain them, kind of want to shepherd them and guide yeah. them. Let hmm. them discover the way themselves. Hmm. Hmm. Did you feel loved in your marriage? I still don't know. Maybe she alone could really answer that, whether she ever truly loved me. But did you feel it yourself? You know, like, and, I, and, and you know, that's, that's what happens because we get lost in the doing, mm -hmm. especially where men are concerned. You do a lot for the women that you truly love. You move heaven and earth for them. And the, the, the thing that breaks my heart is you do all of that because that's your act of, acts of love and acts of service but you don't feel, you know, in those 24 years, do you have memories where you recall, yeah, I felt love here, I felt love here? Yes, but okay, she was very caring really, okay. and very, very um, empathetic to okay. my situation. Um, I know she'd, she'd really do a lot for me and the children, uh, something that I would always, again, put a tag on it. Mm. So as to whether she loved me, I think she did. Maybe it's only that she didn't know how to express it. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Or maybe I didn't also know how to express my love. We loved each other possibly, but we didn't know how to bring it out in the best way possible. Uh, and again, we started conflict relatively early because mm. she can even remind me of something I said in 1994. So what I hear you, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Chacha, is your heart yearns for a reconciliation and a sit down with your first wife. At least she can open up uh, on what it is that you know she's piled inside, and all you want is a sit down and a reconciliation. And when you get to that point, then you will cross that bridge when you get there because then it will be a bit easier because now we are talking. Exactly. Precisely. Um, my, uh, Catherine, I, as somebody who has studied peace and conflict resolution, and again as somebody who leans and borrows heavily from the Bible, from the Holy Word, I believe that my peace is in the hands of my enemy. If I want to have peace, I have to shake the hand of my enemy. Hmm. Because any time you have hatred and bitterness, anger towards your enemy, you don't have peace. Yeah. But when you walk to that person and say, I think, guy, we need to make peace, hmm. your peace begins there. So that's the reason I say that. No wonder Moses advised the Israelites that you shall not be angry until sunset. Hmm. He knew what anger can do. And here we are somebody who has been angry for years, for decades. Mm. I remember, for example, like my, my ex-wife had a conflict with my brother mm. almost 22 years ago, and they have never talked. I mean, you can't keep this. You mm. can't. You have to cross that. So I yearn for that reconciliation, yeah. even if not to come together, mm. but to know that, hey, how are you doing? Mm. Or I needed to talk to you about our son. Yeah. I needed to talk to you about our family. Mm. You know, just that. Mm. I yearn for that. And I think that would be very, very medicinal to yes, my heart. Yes, yes. I was actually going to say that it would be like healing balm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, in choosing to share this story uh, with us, and first of all, I commend you for reaching out. to just want to share it. Most men would not do that. 
and that's why we read a lot in you know in the press uh, we were talking about this before the show where they will kill each other and kill the kids mm -hmm. or if you if the man you know wipes out his family and he doesn't die then he's arrested and spends the rest of his life in jail mm -hmm. and or it turns into a bitter violent toxic marriage so you're both there because you have the fear of leaving but then you're there as the walking dead you left your property you left your wealth you walked out the door and you went to, and started afresh um, and and so why did you choose to share your story let me hope that uh, my story will encourage other men yeah. and it will encourage also the women to know that there are things that can push a man away. to being maybe than a beast. Yes, push a man away and even convert a man to a beast or something else. But more important to the two to the couples out there is don't ever um, don't ever sleep today before you have resolved all the concerns or the issues of today. Yeah. If you have concerns towards your partner, yeah. if you have issues towards your partner, it may be that phone call, it may be that text, it may be even anything. Just before they draw a bed sheet or a duvet over them in the night, let them talk when the children are asleep. Mm. My love, I have this concern. Secondly and lastly is that let them do stock taking. Every week, at least every week, they do stock of their marriage. We didn't do any stock. Things pile. You can imagine, Catherine. For by the time I was asking for that stock taking of yeah. that, that piece of paper, it was eight months. Eight months. No talking. Of running dry. No talking. Actually, for eight months, we had never touched. You know, mm. even Atele Ngozi. My goodness, mm. it's it's much later than I came to realize. Oh my goodness, mm. how did we get here? So that aspect of taking stock in marriage, we need more of this. Hmm? After one week, my love, I'm not comfortable with this. This thing, I observed it over the week. Yeah. Oh, let them explain. Like right now, this, my current wife, mm -hmm. the password to my phone is the same as the password to her phone. When I leave my phone, I have no fear that maybe somebody somewhere will call or she, can, she leaves her phone. No, that's the way it's supposed to be. Yeah. Mutual trust because we don't sleep on an issue or a concern. Yeah. It is talked. If there are men watching, and because I know men talk to men, uh, they feel a bit like I can't tell a woman my problem. Well, at least what I know. If if there are men watching and they want to reach you, could you could you let them know how they can? Are you on yes. social media? You yes, must. You reached I'm, me on I'm, Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm on social media. Yeah, uh, actually, maybe those men who might be going through what I went through, or maybe uh, to the men who are watching, and maybe they are contemplating separating from their wives, all I would say, mm -hmm. please don't. Can you give it 90 days? Just do stock taking of your marriage every day. Don't do it every week. Do it every day. Don't sleep over today's issue. Don't allow them to pile to tomorrow. Uh, two. Let's talk. I'm on social media. My Facebook name is George Chacha. You will always see me there. Um, I'm also on uh, Twitter, um, uh, Chacha7 at Twitter. Okay. My telephone number is 0722 I think let's, if, once people share their problem, a problem shared is a problem half solved. Mm. You are not the only one who is going through that. Um, and the, I know I'm not the last. I'm not the only one. It's only that I've taken a bold step to come forward mm. and want to kind of maybe start a movement of change away from wife battering, yeah. uh, killing and wrecking families. I think mm. uh, let's have a dialogue. Well, Mr. Joe Chacha from Igori County, courier man. Mm -hmm. Thank you for coming. Thank you too for hosting me. And I pray show. that you get the desires of your heart fulfilled with that reconciliation. I pray that uh, your first wife knows, even after watching this show, 
that you still love her in a certain way and yes. you don't hate mm -hmm. her. No, I don't. And that a reconciliation is, you know, we pray that it happens and that God honors that desire of your heart. That's my prayer for you. And all the best with all the initiatives that you're doing. And I think also the blessing that you get to enjoy now is that your, your babies are talking to you, your sons. Mm. You have a relationship with your sons because even if they talk every so often, but at least they talk, you know, because I know in families like this where they would get poisoned a certain way and they don't reach out. So at least even if you hear from them once every three months, at least, at least there's that communication. So, so I pray that that which you desire, you get. Amen. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you watching, you had Mr. Chacha here. If you're going through this in your relationship, and relationship is anything, whether you just started dating yesterday or you've been married 50 years or 20 years, and you just need somebody to talk to, and especially if you're a man, you just reach out to him and just say, hey, I'm going through this. How do I, how do I overcome? I've always said there's no shame in seeking for help. So just reach out to him on Facebook. He gave his number in case um, you didn't catch it. The show goes up on YouTube after this, so you can watch that. Or his Facebook, Joe Chacha. Just find him and just, there's no shame again in just saying, I went through this. He's come on national television to share his story. So you are just going to be talking on social media. So how hard can that be? For me, I just say thank you for, again, making time every week to watch What's Your Story. It is the privilege of my life to get to do this every week. Until we catalyze another story next week. Do take care of yourselves and God bless you.